Hi, everyone. We'll get going pretty quickly because time is limited. Um, thank you for, for um, joining this talk. Um, before we get started, I wanted to do a quick poll and get some sense of the audience. Um, whether people are interested in more introductory material or more, more advanced material. So how many people here already know what gRPC is and are more interested in advanced material? Um, OK. And how many people here would like to, they have heard of gRPC or maybe not, but they want to figure out what the hell is this thing? OK. So I'm going to focus my talk more on the introductory stuff, but I'll be around for questions afterwards. I'll, I'll be in this area. Um, and there's also a panel later this afternoon, uh, the CNCF panel, and I'll be around after that one as well. Uh, OK. So let's get started. So what is gRPC? Um, it's, it's one of the core building blocks um, for building distributed systems that's um, being used heavily at Google. Like, uh, the RPC system that we have had before is, was called Stubby, and that was built just for internal use at Google, and it was targeted at a very homogeneous environment. gRPC is sort of the open source version of it, uh, built for a much more diverse set of use cases. Um, RPCs are used very heavily at Google. Almost every distributed system inside Google um, uses RPCs as, as a core primitive. Uh, and we have tens of billions of, uh, of these flying around uh, every second within our data centers. Um, gRPC stands for gRPC Remote Procedure Calls. Um, we want it to be performant and universal. Um, and it's all developed in open source on GitHub. Uh, and we are switching all of Google internally to this thing as well. Um, so it's a, it's a very ambitious project in the sense of, you know, we are trying to take, um, trying to replace something that's already been used heavily internally. But um, because we see, uh, we have learned internally that RPCs are a very good um, uh, communication primitive. Having, having something uniformly used internally and externally makes life a lot easier for all our users and for us because we have to support fewer, fewer of these RPC systems. Um, it is production ready. Um, current version is 1.2. We cut 1.3 a week ago. Um, and that's going to get released sometime soon. So um, I'm going to jump into a code example to give you a flavor for what RPCs are. I mean, you know, the concept is pretty old. The first paper referring RPCs came out in like 1980s, early 80s. Um, but it's just an, a nice model. So. Um, so we start with uh, an RPC is just something that gives you um, gives you the uh, the programming interface of a function call, a procedure call, except that the procedure call is running remotely, right? Um, so I'm gonna uh, take an example of the Cloud PubSub service. Um, this is the Google Cloud PubSub API. Um, so this is this is on GitHub, uh, Google Cloud PubSub, um, and this this is the specification of the interface. There are a couple of services here. There's a subscriber service and there is a publisher service. And this publisher service has a bunch of RPC methods. There's a create topic method that takes a topic as a parameter and returns back a topic. Um, and that's right there. That's the specification of the interface. Uh, this is done using protocol buffers. You can also use other interface definition languages with gRPC. Um, so given this specification in a protobuf, you can generate APIs in different languages. Um, I'm going to take an example. I'm going to use a Java example, but uh, yeah, we support um, many, many languages, and I'll talk about that coming up. So. Um, this is really four lines of Java code. You start off with some credentials. We have built-in authentication support for things like mutual TLS and OAuth. You create a channel, and a channel is something, it's a higher level concept than a connection. It provides connectivity to a service. So you create a channel, give it the name of the service that you're talking to, and this service can be a big thing like pubsub.googleapis.com, which is you know a load balanced global service, or it can be just the IP port of 
some little server that you brought up on whatever dev machine you control. Um, so the channel is going to use the credentials and connect to this service. And that's about it. And this channel is persistent, it's, it's intelligent, it's going to be load balanced, it's going to uh, 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 watch its own health and it's going to try to reconnect if the TCP connection or connections backing it up fail. Um, on top of the channel we put a stub. That's where we are pulling in the type information that was in the service description. Um, so here's a stub that, that gives us the publisher interface that was in the service description I showed. And, uh, and we are ready to go. We are ready to make RPC calls. Um, this example here shows a blocking RPC call where the, uh, the calling thread is going to block till this create topic method call returns. But you can have um, non-blocking various asynchronous patterns. And again, that will vary language by language. So that, that was my little, um, little digression into code. Uh, coming back, uh, I use the word universal to talk about gRPC. And by that we mean we want it to run everywhere, whether it's, uh, uh, it's in data centers and in the cloud, whether it's on um, devices, mobile devices, um, end user devices, and of course internet of things. Um, it's already used pretty widely. You'll see Docker up there. Um, ContainerD has some gRPC APIs internally that came out um, a couple of months ago. Um, and there's a variety of use cases where um, these different organizations are using gRPC today. So um, I'll go into some more detail on the various aspects of what you get out of gRPC. First of all, it's multi-language. Um, we have nine languages here um, that are supported as part of the core, core offering uh, from the team at Google. Uh, plus it's all open source on GitHub and you know, there are other um, groups outside that have already started contributing um, gRPC implementations in other languages. Um, and that, that's one of the, uh, that's something that really multiplies the usefulness of this thing because you can have, you can build different, uh, you can build multi-tiered services using just the right language for each component without having to say, okay, I'll build everything in this one language because that's all my RPC framework supports. It's also cross-platform. Um, we uh, support uh, st um, standard Linux distributions, but they're also, um, again, um, the open source community has taken it and um, you know, made sure gRPC works not just on you know, Linux, Windows, Mac OS, but also Arduino, RTOS, et cetera, et cetera. And you know, new, new things keep showing up. And that again goes towards this theme of universal. If you, if you build a gRPC service running on some platform somewhere, it should be universally accessible. Anybody should be able to talk to it. And the fact that they are running on a little thermostat somewhere shouldn't be a limiting factor. Uh, protocol buffers gives you this, um, this ability to uh, enforce strict service contracts. I already went through the example, so I'll, I'll just talk about a couple other features for protocol buffers. One is there's good backwards and forwards compatibility in the proto language, um, but you can also use conventions to implement policy for things like semantic versioning or REST or CRUD. We see those things as policy level things sitting above the gRPC layer and not necessarily con in conflict with gRPC itself. In fact, uh, the Google um, recommended um, API conventions uh, do follow the REST philosophies pretty closely. So you can do these things. You just have a convention saying, you know, if you want to do REST, you just say, okay, the APIs must be stateless. If you want to do CRUD, you just enforce that, uh, you know, the same service definition with the CREUD methods should be used by everyone. Um, and gRPC will work um, fairly well in these cases. The next one is uh, about performance. Um, definitely when we are going to do tens of billions of these and use it as a building block for every service that we build at Google, we care a lot about performance. Um, so we, we, um, we looked um, uh, with a very skeptical eye at every uh, protocol that was available and we decided that HTTP2 was going to be performant enough and it was going to give us uh, multiplexing and per stream flow control. Um, so we went with HTTP2 uh, with binary framing and really um, any overheads over speaking pure binary over TCP are, um, 
are in the measurement noise at this point. Uh, and protocol buffers again gives you very tight serialization, so the um, the byte overhead over the wire is really minimized, and that's one reason mobile developers love us because they they really care about getting really compact um, compact wire um, overheads. The design is pluggable, and uh, there is an ecosystem growing up around the pro uh, project. Um, th there's a bunch of monitoring and tracing solutions that the community has started, community and other organizations have started contributing in. Um, for service discovery, there are multiple systems that have, um, that have been plugged in. Um, proxy support is showing up for across a number of proxies. Um, quick, uh, quick plug about authentication. Um, there are built-in authentication and security mechanisms, in particular t uh, TLS and mutual TLS and uh, certain OAuth flavors. And for those, it's, it's a single line of code because you have built-in support for, for the mechanism. And then for, for folks or organizations that need to do something different, um, there is a plug-in mechanism where you can bring in your own auth, auth facilities. We have tried to um, minimize the friction that comes from just having to use um, having to use libraries across across different languages. So, um, for most languages and platforms, there is a single line uh, installation, um, and there are facil facilities uh, such as error, error propagation, cancellation propagation that that give you out of the box rich functionality, uh, which allows application developers to focus really on a higher level of you know their business logic instead of worrying about about the n network and whether or not it's up and running and healthy. <clears throat> Streaming is something I'm going to spend a couple of minutes talking about. Um, so uh, st the idea with streaming is that once you get to a certain level of sophistication, you might want to have operations that take more than just a single shot. Um, and with gRPC, and this was an evolution at Google, we started off with unary RPCs that were single request response, and then we um, had cases where people needed to do big downloads over an RPC, so we added streaming from the server side, and then we had cases where the client needed to stream a lot. So with gRPC, we threw all of that out, and we said, at the base, we'll build something that's bidirectional streaming. So that's what, um, that's what the gRPC protocol is. Uh, at its core, which is the client starts out with some initial metadata, like what RPC method is it, um, what's the deadline, and then it streams a bunch of messages, zero or more, and then it says, okay, I'm done sending my messages. The server, as soon as it sees the initial metadata, the server can start talking back, so the two directions are not coupled at all, and it really depends on um, you know the specific application use case. The server responds with the initial metadata, um, and then it streams back zero or more messages, and at the end it sends back uh, status and some trailing metadata, like you know it might want to report the cost, it might want to give you some detailed errors if you have had an error, and those things will go in the trailing metadata. So that's the full protocol, and we take many, many of these bidirectional streams, multiplex them over the same TCP connection. Um, HTTP2 allows us to go up to 2 to the 31, I believe. Um, and uh, they are individually flow controlled, which means you can have uh, the same client server pair can have many of these streams in flight between them, and they can um, either end can decide which specific stream they want to make progress on, and they, there isn't any head of line blocking, so other streams won't cause the, the one stream that's being made progress on to be blocked. All of the... Um, Right from the beginning, we have we have focused on making gRPC um, open and standards compliant. Um, we have an RFC-like process um, for design changes, um, and we we are now starting to see um, design proposals coming out from the community outside outside of Google. Um, the wire protocol itself is HTTP/2 based, and the there's a lot of interest in standardizing the gRPC layering on top of HTTP2 at IETF as well, so we'll, we'll be working on that as well. Quick note about production readiness. Um, there's again a, 
a lot of focus on making sure that this thing really delivers on this promise of universality. So we have in interop tests on GitHub. You can see um, if you go to our GitHub repo right now, um, th there's over 20,000 tests that run for every pull request. And that includes a, a good number of interop tests across the different libraries. Um, there's also a fair amount of um, fuzzing of, of um, the, the wire, and that actually catches a lot of bugs as well. Um, and a number of organizations are using this in production. Um, a number of Google Cloud services like Cloud PubSub and Cloud Bigtable are, and Cloud Spanner are built on top of gRPC as, a, as the core communication layer. Um, so this is in production today um, at Google and outside of Google at many, many organizations. Um, so this is a quick summary slide of what I, what I talked over. Um, next, I'm going to talk a little more about the advanced features. Um, if, if people have any, any quick questions at this point, I, I can try to take one or two, um, or I'll keep going. Um, so we have, we have a core RPC framework in place now. We have all of the core functionality on the left of this slide done, and we are moving more towards the right side of this slide. And actually, there's a, a small number of these are already done, and the rest are you know, in various stages of design and implementation. So I'm gonna talk um, a little bit about all of these. And you'll see that the ones on the right, these are the advanced functionalities where, where people start uh, having different opinions and conventions and wanting to bring their own, their own things in. So all of this is mostly done in a very pluggable manner, so you can bring in your own stat system or your own tracing system if you want to. Uh, so there's a number of core statistics about um, RPCs that um, everyone is interested in, and we have um, something called census that's going out with gRPC that, that provides um, the real-time tracking of these statistics. Um, and we now have an RPC API to export those statistics out, uh, out to um, monitoring systems that might want to um, look at the overall health of the system based on those stats. Um, the next one is tracing. Um, Google published a paper on Dapper a few years ago, uh, and um, since then there's been uh, uh, a bunch of work out in the open on tracing systems. And um, the idea is that if you have a multi-tiered service, you might want to track an RPC uh, or track a high-level request as it goes through the different tiers of your system uh, across a, a whole tree of RPCs. And, and that's a very useful debugging aid. You probably don't want to run it at a, um, um, for every RPC, but it's good to be able to, sam to sample a small number of top-level requests and say, okay, let's trace the entire life of these requests. And uh, um, that's where gRPC has a generic facility in the metadata to uh, attach traces to requests, and then you have various tracing systems that are being plugged in uh, to provide the tracing functionality. Service config is an, is an interesting concept that we've been working on um, for quite a while now. The idea is that a lot of times things like, um, things like uh, deadlines or retry policies are something that you don't necessarily want individual clients to pick and instead the service owners might want to tell the clients what they should do when they run into uh, various corner cases. Um, so this is really something that service operators love because as an operator of a service, you can say, hey, any client talking to this service must use a deadline of this and must retry at most three times before they give up. And with gRPC, you can do that. So we attach, um, for, if we are using DNS for discovery, then we use a text record to put all of the service config in there. And then when a client resolves the name, they get the service config along with the name and the client library knows to honor the service config and to say, okay, we will do retries with these configurations when the service has um, configured it that way. So I already talked about retries. Um, that's one of the, one of the common things uh, that people run into. Um, in distributed computing, you can never 
assume that the network is perfect and 100% reliable. So you're going to run into situations where you have to retry a request. Um, and um, making it automatic under the hoods means that as a developer, you don't have to worry about it. You, you leave it to your service owner, to whoever is operating the service to decide what retry policy they want. They describe that policy in the config and the client library just does it for you. So at, a high, at, at the gRPC um, client side interface, you don't think about retries anymore. You instead just rely on the built-in retry system. Load balancing is, is another, another interesting topic, and this, this can be an entire talk in itself. Uh, I'm gonna just spend one slide on it. Um, and I'm gonna talk about, uh, talk about three models. Um, okay. Uh, um, I'm gonna wrap up with this slide. So um, there's proxy-based load balancing, and I already mentioned a bunch of proxies. Um, there is um, client-side load balancing, where you kind of have more business logic on the client side to decide how to spread its load. And with gRPC, we also have a third model where we have a look-aside load balancer that sits on the side just for control. The client asks the load balancer where it should go, and the balancer tells the client where to go, and then the client directly connects to that backend and goes there. Um, uh, so that's why we call it look-aside, because it's not in the data path, it's just on the control path. It allows us to keep the business logic out and allows us to um, sort of have a real, really fast and performant communication between client and backend while having sophisticated load balancing logic running on the side. I'll stop with that and I'll take questions offline. Thank you.